Hi friends, welcome back to Literature Guide. Today's video is about John Dryden's definition of English drama. In his essay of dramatic poesy published in 1668, John Dryden has given a definition of drama before the four friends begin their conversation or debate. The essay has been written in a dialogic form. Dryden as Neander has expressed his views on the ancient and the modern drama. The four friends discuss about comparative merits of English and French drama. Aristotle in his Poetics has defined drama as an imitation of action. According to Aristotle, human passions and character is in the background. But in an essay of dramatic poesy, John Dryden has given great freedom to a literary artist and has given importance to human passions and humors. He has appreciated the English plays by William Shakespeare, John Fletcher and Ben Jonson. This video contains detailed information about Dryden's concept of drama. I have already produced two videos on John Dryden and the heroic couplet in tragedy and John Dryden's views on the three dramatic unities. If you really like the content produced by this channel, do like and subscribe Literature Guide. If you want to get more information, you can visit a website. The link of the website is there on the screen. I don't want to waste your time. Let's dive into a video and enjoy the video. John Dryden's Definition of Drama In his essay on dramatic poesy, John Dryden gives us a workable definition of a play, before debating upon the conflicting issues the four friends feel the necessity of definition of drama. Lysidius after some modest denials, defines drama as a just and lively image of human nature representing its passions and humors and the changes of fortune to which it is subject, for the delight and instruction of mankind. In their following discussion this definition serves them as a lighthouse. The whole defense and argument of Dryden refers to it. Hence, it is taken to be an appropriate one. The first thing is that a play is an image of human nature. It is not a servile copy, it resembles and at the same time differs from human nature. The range of human nature to be imitated is wide. John Dryden includes the things as they were or and also the things as they are said to be. In the author's apology for heroic poetry and poetic license, he says, Poets may be allowed the liberty for describing things which really exist not, if they are founded on popular beliefs. So the subject matter can include the fairies and pygmies and pastoral deities too. These may be seen in William Shakespeare's The Tempest and Midsummer Night's Dream and Ben Jonson's Mask of Witches. A play is an image of human nature mainly because it represents its passions and humors, so many human emotions, passions with which a heart throbs, and all the intricate subtle psychic processes are to be portrayed. Humor refers to some extravagant habit, passion or affection, particular to some one person. By the oddness of this humor, the person is immediately distinguished from the rest. It is subject of comedy like Johnson's Silent Woman. These passions and humors are revealed when some changes of fortune are represented. It is the telling circumstances which reveal character. Though these events of crisis and change rise and fall of fortune, myriad emotions are revealed. This is seen in life, and drama being an image of human life, must of necessity imitates it. Here, Dryden has explained that emotions or character is expressed through action. 
The phrase changes of fortune refers the plot. Now, Aristotle explains drama as an imitation of an action. In his theory, human passions or character is in the background. On the other hand, Dryden gives importance to the passions, and humors though they are revealed through action. Aristotle's observation is quite consistent with the Greek dramas while Dryden's view is formed by Shakespeare's play like, Hamlet and Othello. Here is a slight shift from the Aristotelian structural criticism to the modern psychological realism. The poet imitates human nature or psychic process. So his imitation is just or true to life. But this is not sufficient. It also differs from human life. In comedy, someone's passion is shown in exaggeration. That passion is found in reality, but the exaggeration is deliberate here. The purpose is to arouse laughter. Hence, in his examen of the silent woman, John Dryden says, this laughter is only accidental, as the person represented is fantastic or bizarre, but pleasure is essential to it, as the imitation of what is natural. So in comedy, the humor is simultaneously natural and unnatural. In tragedy too, all the represented passions are drawn from human life. Still they differ from their real counterparts for they are brought up to a higher pitch, or exalted. A play, says Dryden, to be like nature is to be set above it as statues which are placed on high are made greater than the life that they may descend to the sight in their just proportion. As a result, a play becomes a creative act. The dramatist's image of human nature is true to life, yet it differs from it. But, Dryden adds here, that it is lively also. A work of art becomes from a highly individual standing of a play. This differentiates that play from other plays. Now, a play becomes aesthetically satisfying. Here, John Dryden differs from Sir Philip Sidney who abandons the real life for one golden world of art which is another nature. In Dryden's scheme of criticism a play is not another nature. It is true to life and lively. The last part of the definition tells us the end or function of dramatic art. The image is represented for the delight and instruction of mankind. Elsewhere, Dryden asserts that pleasure is the chief thing, instruction has a secondary place. He says delight is chief if not the only end of poesy, instruction can be admitted but in the second place. It is suggested by some critics that the word instruction should not be considered strictly in moral sense. A play reveals the mysterious image of psychic greatness. This knowledge of the human mind itself is a sort of instruction. It gives us insight into these mental workings. Now, it may be said that in a great work of art pleasure and instruction are one and the same. Philip Sidney's distinction between delight and teaching does not enter here. The pleasure of a play is experienced by mankind. This last word in the definition is important. A good play has the appeal to all the people of all nations and times. This is its universality. John Dryden has discussed in his essay how the spirit of age and the spirit of nation influence literature. The conditions and the temper of these two are reflected in literature. This may obstruct the universal appreciation of a play. But a play, is primarily and principally an image of human psyche. These passions and emotions are present in every age and people. Hence, a good play succeeds always in addressing the mankind. In the 20th century we can enjoy Hamlet or Macbeth. Obviously, Dryden's concept of all universality is based more on psychological realism than the Aristotelian probability. Our analysis of John Dryden's definition of drama shows some of its specialities. His libertine attitude gives the playwright a license to imitate things from as they ought to be to as they are said to be. Secondly, he seems to give importance to the passion and emotional structure of a play. This is a shift from Aristotle's teaching. Thirdly, in Sir Philip Sidney the world of art becomes golden because the poet does not follow nature, but the idea. On the other hand, Dryden says that a play becomes lively when it follows human nature. Another function of art is to delight a reader and to move him to virtuous action. 
In Dryden's thinking, pleasure is the supreme thing. It is more of psychological nature like Aristotle's catharsis in which moral benefit is implicit and secondary thing. And lastly, though John Dryden accepts Aristotle's law of probability, the universal appeal of a play, as we have seen, relies more on the workings of human mind. Now, it becomes quite clear that Dryden's definition of drama is an improved version over that of Aristotle. It also betrays the influence of preceding English drama. How is the video? I hope you liked the video. I have recently produced two videos on John Dryden and the heroic couplet in tragedy and John Dryden's views on the three dramatic unities. I have published many videos on different topics of English literature. For more information, you can visit a website. The link of the website is there on the screen. I would like to thank all my subscribers and non-subscribers who have given great support to this channel literature guide. I am going to upload some more videos on John Dryden. Be ready for the videos to come. I will meet you soon with a new and fresh topic of English literature. Meet you.